The deal is, is we're surrounded by National Park Wilderness. In most places in rural Alaska, the state would grant you land somewhere outside of, you know, where it's state land and you would drive out there and you establish your landfill. You know, you put in the road and stuff like that. Here, that's the National Park. So it's really not an option. So we're basically looking at what the city has for managing its solid waste so it behooves the city to extend its lifespan as long as they can because what are your alternatives? What we're looking at in the future is basically shipping out as much as we can. We ship out recyclables now, but kind of focusing on starting to ship solid waste. But that area inside the fence was what was originally uh, leased to the community from the state, and that was approximately, you know, maybe a 10-year lifespan. So now it's going on 20 years. So it's more than doubled, and it has the capacity I don't know, four to eight years. It's a demonstration of how you can extend the life of your facility by is moving as much stuff. And, and also we do repurposing, like there's uh, uh, tiles and stuff like there, which is an aggregate that we bust up and I use as an underlayment. And same with toilets, we have a stash of toilets there. I'll bust those up and use it as an aggregate. Sheetrock is used as an intermediate fill and that wouldn't work so good in lower 48 because sheetrock by itself add moisture to it you can get bad uh, hydrogen sulfur gas conditions because there's a bacteria, but that bacteria needs 80 to low, not in the low 90s, but upper 80s humid temperatures in order for it to start. But in Alaska, we don't get those kind of temperatures, so we don't have that problem. Gotcha. So as much of the waste stream as possible, it can be repurposed. We do, because once this is complete, you'd have to move the mound over there or continue the mound over there, not move, but continue the mound. and so. You know, is that what you want in the middle of your community? And the more waste you have mounted, the more risk you have for groundwater contamination and the more risk you have for odor issues sometime down the line, so. Gustavus doesn't have a pickup service. It's all uh, self-delivered. You know, customers are bringing their own. And the primary separation is between what is recyclable and what's not recyclable, with the recyclables being cheaper so that there's a a benefit for people separating out what's recyclable or they'll save money. You see all steel cans right here? These rates are subsidized by the city. They're subsidized by the thrift store, which is a part of our operation, and they're subsidized by the sale of recyclables. So it, it's costing us 31 cents to 35 cents a pound to process the waste, but we're only charging the public 19 cents to 24 cents. So, you know, I'm making it as cheap as I can, but it's still, those kind of rates, you know, compared with lower 48 are rather expensive. So that's the first point of entry for a customer is the scale house and to, you know, assess out the cost of once they have weighed their recyclables, it's all laid up against, and some of them are free, like aluminum is free. But this basically is what is recyclable from food waste, to aluminum, Glass, light bulbs, uh, plastics, metals, both tin cans and scrap metal, and then the paper products. Kind of loop there and cardboard goes way in the back. You know, so the customer is responsible for doing the sorting because we cannot afford or have the technology to do uh, that much separating ourselves. You know, because in the lower 48, you'd normally have a materials recovery facility. Everybody would have their blue bin. You'd send it to the materials recovery facility, and machinery and people would put it into a spin. So we're here. The people get to be the million dollar materials recovery facility and do all of the separation. So that keeps our cost down, but also makes it possible because two operators couldn't sort all of it. 
I mean, we do some sorting because we have a mixed waste category, which is kind of the penalty rate that people pay if they've brought waste that's got food waste and stuff in it. And we may or may not separate it. Yeah, when you're not uh, burning your waste, you need some method of uh, reducing its volume, and balers are a good uh, volume reduction. Because uh, landfills, their whole commodity is airspace, so you want to consume your airspace as slow as possible. So these kind of things, ideally everything would be super compressed. It's just too disgusting of an operating environment. Mm -hmm. The idea here is to keep it up out of groundwater, never mind the snow, protect it from the rain so it's not... Uh, Water is percolating through it and carrying the contaminants into the groundwater. This model does not transplant exactly because it has a lot of gustative value. But there are aspects of it, say composting or you know pulling things out of the waste stream and finding out other you know avenues of use for them. This wouldn't work anywhere else because this evolved an individual, a community, you know, a service kind of slowly coming up together as opposed to a finished product, here you are, bang! If, if it's a community that doesn't want to pay, you know, then you would have to have a whole different model for taking stuff in. Or if they don't want to sort their recyclables in their own categories.